People fight over the pew they bought or whatever those kind of things. <laughs> oh, let's just pray. Father, we come before you right now and we just ask for your grace and your anointing upon the Word of God today. And we pray right now, Spirit of God, that you just manifest your truth in this Word. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I want to just ask you... Uh, the most famous person you've ever met, just to, in around. So somebody can just name and call out the most famous person you've ever met. Anybody? Mark Chestnut. Mark Chestnut, okay. President Bush. John Wayne. Ooh, John Wayne. Johnny Carson. John Elway. John, John Elway. Oh, I like that. Pardon? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Wow, there, there, there's some big names. Jerry Savelle. Jerry Savelle. Yeah, man. The most famous person I've ever met is Muhammad Ali. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, in a while, but do you know that when you meet somebody really famous, the way you think you're going to act and the way you act are two different things? Has anybody ever understood that? I remember when I was younger, we, we were huge basketball fans, and my, my dad, one Christmas, he took us to see a Phoenix Suns Los Angeles Laker game. And in my family, basketball was just something that was just a prevalent sport. We played it year-round. It didn't matter when or where. We played basketball all the time. And so Arizona didn't have a team at all for years. So our team was the Los Angeles Lakers. Does anybody remember those days when Arizona didn't have any pro sports teams? And so we listened to the Los Angeles Lakers, and there were three guys that played for the Lakers. And, and some of you may know these names. There was a guy named Lou Alcindor, who became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, whom my wife has met personally. There was a guy named Jerry West. Anybody remember a guy named Jerry West? And a guy named Algin Baylor. And, and after, after the game was over, me and my brothers ran down to, to where the, uh, the basketball players walk into the locker room. And I, I got there and I just, I just froze because I was standing right next to uh, Lou Alcindor. And I, I didn't even say anything, but you act different when you're in the presence of somebody who's famous or, or somebody that is well known. Maybe you don't. I did. Being from a country boy, it just, it just stunned me and shocked me. And I didn't even say hi. I didn't even ask for an autograph. I just watched him walk by. And what an amazing thing is the most famous person you know is Jesus Christ. And you're not going to just let him walk by, are you? That's right. That's right. The most famous person you know is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you're not going to let him walk by, are you? So we're going to talk about that today. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 12 that there was a gal that thought she had reached a uh, spiritual plateau, and her name was Miriam. And she operated in the kingdom of Israel. She was a, pa a patriarch. She was a prophetess in Israel. She was Moses' sister, not Abraham's sister. She was Moses' sister. <laughs> you have to be here last week to understand that. And... It was interesting in that story. We're not going to read all that, but Miriam came against her brother Moses. And how many do you understand that Moses had an anointing that was really mighty and really powerful? And she calls out her mother, Moses, brother Moses, and, and Miriam's issue is with actually with Moses' wife. It's a thing, and the Bible clearly tells us that. And Moses' wife and Miriam, apparently, I don't know, they had their issues or whatever. She was a Midianite. And in that process, one day she makes a statement. And she says to her brother Aaron, doesn't God speak to us just like he speaks to Moses? Aren't we just as important as Moses? And she gets full of herself in the kingdom of God. And she says this, you know, God speaks to us too. We need to be telling the people of Israel what to do. Doesn't he speak to us also? And God says Miriam, I heard what you said. How many know that everything you say is open to God? Yep. Amen. Everything we say, according to Hebrews 4.12, all things are manifest in His sight, and all things are open and naked to Christ. And in that naked is talking spiritually. So everything you say, everything you do, and everything you think is open to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Say everything's open to Christ. Everything. You need to understand that, that when you get to heaven, you're going to talk about everything you think, everything you say, everything you do, and everything you have hid in your heart. And God calls Miriam out, and he calls the meeting of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And when the meeting's over, the cloud lifts in the department of God, the glory of God goes. And Miriam is standing there, and she's covered in leprosy. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever thought you've arrived and you've come to a place spiritually, there are situations in life that will demonstrate to us we all still need and have areas of growth in our spiritual walk with the Lord. 
Everybody in here needs a spiritual, uh, spiritual enlightenment to your walk and spiritual growth. Nobody has arrived. Say, I have not arrived. I have not arrived. And what's interesting is after the cloud lifts and the Miriam is covered in leprosy, Moses goes to God and he says, oh, Lord, would you heal her? And Moses prays for her. And God, here, I, want to, I want to just get this in your spirit. This is what God says. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord God Almighty. It's in Numbers 12. You can read it. He says, if her father had spit in her face, wouldn't she have been shamed and had to be put outside the camp for seven days? Yeah. That's what God said to Moses. And God told Moses, I will heal her. But he said, she not, just did not attack you, Moses. She attacked me because the Bible clearly says that she spoke against Moses, God's servant. Yes. God handpicked Moses and she spoke against him. And God said, no, I took it personal. It was against you, but it also affected what my integrity of who I am. So God puts leprosy on this situation, which is, is indication spiritually of sin. And he puts her out of the camp. Now, what I want to get to you is this. God told Moses, he said, I want the children of Israel to stop and we're not moving for seven days until she is cured and healed of her leprosy. Miriam's sin stopped one million people in their tracks and kept them from moving on with God. Hello? Yeah. Miriam's sin stopped one million people that God said, you're not going anywhere. Sit down. Stop. Take a break. You're not going forward. Until this deal is dealt with Mary. My question today is, who are you affecting with your issues? Wow. Don't think you're not affecting somebody. Your issues might be affecting your children, your grandchildren. They might be affecting your neighbors. They might. Your issues are affecting somebody. Yes. One million people, God said. Nope, you're, stop it, Moses. Nobody's moving forward. My question to you today is, who are you stopping from moving forward? Hmm, hallelujah. And how do we reach that point of, of, of getting away from shooting yourself in the foot? Anybody understand spiritually shooting yourself in the foot? Yes. Doing stupid things is like, Lord, I, I shouldn't have said that. Lord, I, I shouldn't have done that. And how many we have what I call incidents of just stupidity, and we do things and we say things that we wish we could take back or wish we hadn't said, and we do it out of the zeal of our flesh. Yeah. Anybody, anybody understand what I'm talking about? The zeal of our flesh. Anybody have that problem other than me? Four hands, the rest of you, I guarantee you got the problem. You're just lying. <laughs> Bible says it's he who says he has no sin, he's lying. The, 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 I'm just quoting Bible. At least I know Bible. So I've asked the Lord in my life, Lord, how do I reach a point that I get past the insanity of stupidity spiritually? Have you ever met people in your life spiritually that are spiritual giants and you look at their life and you're in awe of their life? Are there any spiritual giants that you're in awe of? Yes. I mean, there, there, are, there are some spiritual giants in my life, honestly, that I'm in awe of. I'm in awe of the wisdom that they have, the, the revelation that they have, the lives that they lead, the, the, the blessing of God that's upon their lives. The, brother, the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. Yeah. That, that's what the Word of God says. Give honor to whom honor is due. And so there, there's some men in my life, and I've looked at that, and I've said, Lord, how do you reach out plateau? And, and I've been just searching with the Lord and searching in the Scripture and, and meditating. Lord, how does the church reach that state of understanding that we can walk into a place where we don't do stupid things anymore? How do we grow into that maturity? I'm going to talk about that today. So the most famous person you ever met. Mine was Muhammad Ali. I've heard a lot of names around the room today, but I'm going to tell you the most famous person you've met is Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, in 1 Timothy 1.17, the Apostle Paul, he writes something very specifically. He's come to an understanding that he has come out of Israel. He's come out of the teachers of the law. We know that he said it under Gamil, and he, he had probably one of the most under, intense understandings of the law from the Old Testament. But he's been changed by a meeting with God. And in that meeting with God, God begins to reveal himself. And Paul now is understanding at this point that Jesus Christ was the prophesied king, that all the prophets of Israel prophesied that would be coming, and that Israel missed their Messiah, and that Jesus Christ was also their king, the king of Israel. Paul now realizes this and has this spiritual understanding of who Jesus Christ is, who he was, and who he will be eternally. Jesus Christ is not just your Lord. He's not just your Savior. He is your King eternal. Yes. 
And what God is wanting to do is for the church to re-embrace the idea that Jesus Christ is our King and that will affect your life when you stand and under, get this understanding of your spirit. I'm standing in the omnipresence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That will change who you are. In 1 Timothy 1.17, Paul says, Now unto the King Eternal is what it says. Look at that in your Bibles. Unto the King Eternal. Paul is now describing Jesus Christ. And the first description that he has for the Lord of glory is what? King. Not Savior. Not Lord. It is King. Everybody say King. king. My goodness. The first description of the Lord of glory is King. Amen. Not Savior. Not Lord. Can you say amen to that? Amen. When are you going to make him your King? I know he's your Savior, but when are we going to make him King? He is the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. To him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Apostle Paul says, I've looked through the law. I know all of the wisdom of the law. And it has pointed to the fact that Jesus Christ is not just the Messiah. He's not just Savior. He's not just Lord. He is the King of glory eternal forever under the name of Melchizedek and the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. And God has sent himself a king and his name is Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeah. Paul now understands that and he tells us his first name is King. He's always been king, eternal, immortal. He's always been king. Say, Jesus is my king. Jesus is my king. So the message of the Bible is about a king and a kingdom. It's not about religion or traditions or denominations or isms. The goal of God was and is to extend and establish his heavenly kingdom on earth. He wants to extend his invisible heavenly kingdom to the visible earth and into your life. God's, this is God's ultimate goal. The Lord's prayer clearly defines this. Our Father which art in heaven, anybody quote it with me if you know it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Or does it say on earth later when you come in your second coming? No, it says on earth as it is in heaven. Say with me, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, I want you to pray the kingdom of God come into your life now. Do you know when you got born again that the kingdom of God came into your life? When you got, you read John chapter 3. Jesus said, the born again experience is the entrance into the kingdom of God. I live in the kingdom of God. You and I live in the kingdom of God. That, that is something we need to celebrate. And God wants to establish that heavenly kingdom to our earthly kingdom and release his fullness in our lives. God wants to release the influence, his influence from the invisible. To the visible world. God wants to release his influence into your life. Yes. His goodness in your life. His mercy in your life. His blessing in your life. His wisdom in your life. His knowledge. His God wants to influence your life with his wisdom. And his presence. The incarnation of God was the coming of a king. The incarnation of God was the entrance of a king into this world. In Luke 3.31. Excuse me. 131. The Holy Spirit, what is it? Excuse me, the angel Gabriel, he says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus or Yeshua. And he will be great and be called son of the most high, the highest of God. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. Where does the king sit? Where does the king sit? On the throne. On the throne. And he will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom. There shall be no end. So apparently Jesus Christ was king, is king and will be king forever. Apparently, he is king forever. And Jesus was king not only by heavenly proclamation, but by earthly origination from Mary. How many, do you understand Mary was of the tribe of Judah? She was of the tribe of David. Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. If Mary had been of another tribe, I'm going to tell you this whole thing would be false. Jesus had an absolute perfect birth in proclamation by the Father that he will be the Son of God. In proclamation that he will come through the seed of a woman. He will come through the legitimate origination from the king of his father, David. And so Jesus has a right to sit on the throne in our lives from heaven and also from earth. Amen. He has that right. Hallelujah. Your Jesus Christ, your God, Jesus Christ is a king. Amen. So heaven has proclaimed it. The Bible absolutely gives him origination from the seed of Mary that he is the king. In Matthew chapter 1, the wise men got a message from God. What was their message? That a king was born in Israel. Yes. A king. That was the message God gave to them. They came looking for a king. Not a savior, not a redeemer, not a baptizer. They came looking for a king. And so the message to the wise men, a king was born in Israel. 
Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you it's time for the church to re-embrace our roots of understanding. Jesus Christ is our King. I will know He's your Savior. I hope He's your Lord. But I trust you come to an understanding that He is your King. Yes. Yes. So when the wise men go to Herod, they said, We heard that a King is born in Israel. A King is born. Say with me, a King is born. A King is born. Right now we always hear at the Christmas time, a wise men know Jesus and they still seek him. But I'm going to make a new one this year. Wise men know Jesus is their king. Amen. That's the one I'm going to make this year for Christmas time. Yes. So Jesus was the incarnation of God as a king. Jesus was royalty at birth. Yes, I don't know about you, but anybody in this room like westerns or is it just me? I, I was raised on westerns. I was... When I, when I was younger, my mother's aunt owned the drive-in theater and the show theater, and we got in free, and so I saw every Western ever made as a kid. And I love the genre. I can't get away from the genre. And, and you know, for years, Hollywood quit making uh, Westerns, and then, then finally, you know, they made a movie called Silverado. And, and if you ever get a chance, I'll tell you, watch it. It's a wonderful Western. I, I can tell you, there's as many good lines in there as are in Tombstone. But I'm a, I'm a fan of the Western genre, okay? Okay, so I'll get back to the sermon. <laughs> But in, in one, one movie, in, in Unforgiven, there, there's a point where English Bob, a character played by Richard Harrison, they're discussing in, in, in a discussion the difference between America having a president and England having a king. And in the discussion, he's saying, you, you people don't understand anything about royalty or majesty because you have a president and he's elected. But he said, if you come to England and you'll grow up in our system and you understand the majesty and royalty of a king or a queen... He said, you'll understand the power of it. And he says this. He says, what you'll understand is, he say, how do, how do I say it? And, and he said, you'll stand in awe. As only Richard Harris can say. Yeah. Say, we'll stand in awe. We'll stand in awe. You don't have to wait to stand in awe of your King Jesus Christ. You can start doing that right now. You can do it right now. Yes. How do I say it? We shall stand in awe. Get, check out the movie. It, it's a good movie. So Jesus Christ was the incarnation of God. But he came as a king. He came in royalty at birth. In 1977, there was a very famous pastor. He was in England uh, during the 50th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's celebration of her, uh, the Queen of England. And in the two weeks that uh, Jack Hayford was over there, and, and he, fell, he, he was a pastor of church on the way, and everybody, most people know his name. He was mesmerized by the British people's attitude towards their queen. And he was mesmerized by the fact that they called her majesty all the time. Her majesty. Say with me, majesty. majesty. They, they, they spoke of her in reverential terms. And, and he, he, began to, he went to the birthplace of Winston Churchill and he saw some of the great parts of England. He saw a whole nation come together to celebrate the centennial celebration of Queen Elizabeth. And he realized they have... A reverence for a queen that the king should, that the church should have for their king. They have a reverence for their queen that the church should have for our king. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's what he came away with. And that's on the way home. He was right. He told his wife, write these words down. And these were the words that she wrote. He said, Majesty, worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom, authority. Flow from His throne unto His own, His anthem raise. Anybody remember that song? And that's where that song came from. A man who watched people stand in awe of an earthly queen. And him realizing God's own people won't stand in awe of their heavenly king. That's where he wrote that song. I'm going to talk about another song called Majesty in a minute here. So Jesus not only came as Savior, but He came as a king. to bring His kingdom and restore His kings in the earth. How many know you are kings and priests unto God? That's yes, right. Amen. Two people, raise their hand. You are a king and a priest unto God, according to Revelation 1.6. And Jesus talks about that to be born again. He said, he said that perception and that reality when you come through the born again experience, you're stepping into the kingdom of God. Do you understand when you got born again, you it came in, you entered the kingdom of God. Amen. But it's one thing to enter the kingdom, it's another thing to serve the king. Jesus didn't come to establish religion or repair a religion. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, you can think about that during the week. He came to reestablish the kingdom of God that was lost in the garden. 
and to restore kingships to his sons. You know, God has called us sons. Not slaves. God has called us sons. Yes. And if we are sons and we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Say, so God has called me a son. God has called me a son. We are sons of God. Amen. We're not slaves. We're not servants. And God wants to bring and restore that kingship of sons, his sons in the earth. The ultimate culmination of God's plan was to return us, his people, his children, to sons and kingship in the earth. God's idea is for you to rule and reign in this earth. Okay, let me go a little bit deeper there. God's idea is for me to rule and reign in my marriage. Yes. Have dominion in my marriage. Her have dominion in my marriage. So that the devil has no dominion in this marriage. Yes. God has total dominion because I'm reigning as a king and a priest. How, how many know that God wants you to have dominion in your children's lives? Yes. If you've got children running around, children running around doing all things, God says you can take dominion over that. You can claim to, they're, they're your seed, they're your children. You're a king and a priest unto God. God says you can take dominion over that. Amen. Amen. And God wasn't wanting you to have dominion to dominate people. He's wanting you to have the dominion over the kingdom of darkness. Right, right. Ooh, this is exciting. I, I just praise God. I'll probably get saved from this message. <laughs> God has good for you. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you. God has thoughts and plans for you for goodness. God has good plans for your life. Can you say with me, God has good plans? God has good plans. Are you serious? Yes. We've preached 30 minutes already? 20 minutes. Okay. Live, oh boy. So, <clears throat> the origin of kingship in 1 Timothy 1.17. Paul's writing again to Timothy and he says, Now unto the king eternal. Everybody say king eternal. King eternal. Ooh, king eternal. That is Jesus' first name, King Eternal. King. That is Jesus' first description as King. Jesus was King before He was ever your Savior. Amen. Now, unto the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is what the Apostle Paul was writing. And at one time, he was persecuting Christians who believed in the name of Jesus. But he had a revelation with Christ. He had a heavenly kingdom experience with God. And he saw who Jesus Christ was. And he says, now, I missed it. I was wrong. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He is our Messiah. He's a King. He's our King. He's Israel's King. The wise men were right. I missed it. Paul understood it finally. Hallelujah. So to understand this, we have to understand kingship. You know, when Jesus healed ten lepers, it was interesting that of the ten lepers he healed, the Bible says that they went on their way, and as they went on their way, they were healed. And the Bible says, how many returned to give Jesus thanks? One. How many? One. And he was a Samaritan. A Samaritan. So here's the issue with being, having a Savior. A lot of times with a Savior... A friend of mine one time, when he was, and I, you've heard this story, he was 86 years old and fishing at Sunrise Lake in October, and two guys were in a canoe from New Mexico, they fell in the lake, and they were literally drowning. And his wife honked the horn, she was up on a plateau with her truck, because she wouldn't let him go fishing without her up there watching. So she honks the horn, and they go down. At 86 years old, he saves two men's life, and they're third, both of them are 30 years old from New Mexico. At the end of October, how do you know at 9,400 feet, the water's a little cold in October? And he saves both those men's life. Both of them. He's 86 years old. He drags them over the back of his boat. He takes them back to shore. They can't even move. He gets them out. He lifts them at 86 years old, puts them in their car, starts the car, gets them warmed up. His wife brings down hot chocolate, and he saves both their lives. My God Almighty, you would think they would be gracious and merciful and thanking him forever, wouldn't you? Yes. One did, one didn't. So he was their savior, but to one of them, he was... Just some guy that came along, pulled me out of the water eventually. The other guy sent him a card every Christmas, thanking him for saving his life. Every Christmas, every Christmas till he passed away. So with a Savior, it's almost, you're only as good as your last miracle. You're only as good as your last deed. Even believers, he's my Savior. Well, what have you done for me lately? Honestly, some believers, oh, Lord, I've done that. What has he done for me lately? I got news for you. God has done something for you eternally. And so here is what we need to understand. King came back. Excuse me, nine left and one came back and he was a Samaritan. For kingdom people, it's not what have you done for me lately. It's thank you what you have done for me eternally. 
That's the difference between kingdom people and religious people. Religious people are, well, he ain't done nothing for me lately. Kingdom people are, man, I thank you, God, for what you've done for me eternally. In fact, do you remember what Jesus told the disciples when they came back after they had cast out the demons and he sent out the 70? They were rejoicing that the demons were subject to him. And Jesus said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, no, no. He said, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. How many of you can rejoice that your name is written in heaven? And guess who wrote your name there? Guess who wrote your name there? Guess who wrote your name there? Who wrote your name there? Your king, Jesus Christ, wrote your name there. Hallelujah. It wasn't Mark Twain. Your king, Jesus Christ, wrote your name there. So Jesus told his disciples, why don't, you, why don't you really rejoice over the true thing I've done eternally? Notice the description. I am a king eternal, not a president, not a prime minister. I'm a king. Jesus Christ is a king eternal. And we need to begin to recognize him as our king. A king eternal. You know, the Lord told Samuel, and, and you can read in 1 Samuel, it's, I believe it's around chapter 6 or 7, where Samuel is lamenting that Israel wants a king, and they haven't chose Samuel. And Samuel, Samuel is, is, it's interesting, Samuel is in his lament. The voice of the Lord comes to Samuel, and it declares very clearly, Samuel, it's not that they have rejected you, they have rejected me as their king. In fact, if you get one translation, another translation, it was, and it says this, it says they no longer want me as their king. They no longer want me as their king. Lord, I need a savior, but king, I don't know. See, to understand God and truly and understand Jesus Christ in the opera office and their ministry, you have to understand kingship. He says, I am immortal. I cannot die. I'm deathless. I'm immortal. I cannot die. Ever living to make an intercession for those. How many know that your king is making intercession for you? So my king is not only a, a lawyer, he's making intercession for me. So my king is my lawyer who wrote the law, so he knows God's law about what it says about me. So he can never misinterpret what God said about me, who I am, what is my, rightfully mine, and what God wants to do for me. He cannot misinterpret his own law. Because the area of the law that is, is not completely understood is what was the intent of the writer. So if Jesus Christ is my attorney, he knows the intent of the writer. Can you say amen? There's no gray if he's my attorney. I am a king eternal. I am a king eternal. I'm immortal. I am deathless. I am invisible. I am above the natural world. I am omnipresent. You can't see him, but he's sitting right beside you. So when you go to work, he's there. When you go to bed, he's there. When you get up, he's there. So you're living in the omnipresence, ever-present, omnipresence. Does anybody know Jesus is omnipresent? The Bible says he is. Omnipresent God. So he's with you at all times. So now that I know that, it should affect how I act and react and what I say and what I think I, and I, what I do because I'm now standing in the presence of royalty and majesty. Yes. That's what the Bible calls him, majesty. Majesty. Hallelujah. He said, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which were seen. Think about that. Everything in your life that is seen was made by that which was unseen. That's what Hebrews says, Hebrews 11.3. Everything that is seen was made by that that was unseen. I am what? The invisible God. I just read it to you there in Timothy. I am the visible. God said, I made all this. And I took it from the invisible and made it visible in your life. It would blow your mind if you saw what was in the invisible that God wants to make tangible in your life. It would blow your mind. You would pray our Father in heaven every day if you knew what was in the invisible that God has for you for the visible. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think about that. So, the things that are seen, they were not made by things which are visible. So that, that means that everything came, came from that which is unseen, which means that that which is unseen is more real than that which is seen. So that which is temporary is also that which is unreal and is eternal. So you need to put your trust in something that won't wear out. You need to put your trust in something that cannot be moved, cannot be shaken. My trust is in the internal, invisible God. Everything I'm experiencing came from the unseen. And God said, let there be what? Light. And God said, let there be water. 
Let there be firmament. Let there be animals. It all came from the unseen world. The invisible God. This is the God we're worshiping. This is the God that we need to have allegiance to. So everything you got on right now came from the unseen. Every, those chairs came out of the unseen. Into the visible world. In 1 Timothy 5.16, Paul goes on to say, God who is the blessed and the only ruler. The only ruler. Say with me, the only ruler. The only ruler. <laughs> that means everybody else is faking it. That's right? right? That's true. If Jesus Christ is the only ruler, everybody else is faking it. Yeah. It's, it's a lie. It's a sham. And he goes on to say, for he is the king of kings and lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light. Hallelujah. I want to go to the trial of Jesus in John chapter 18, 37. They answer, ask Jesus many, many questions. The trial before the Sanhedrin, and Jesus didn't answer hardly any questions, except those that were related to his godhood. And when he came before Pilate, Pilate had asked him some questions, Jesus didn't answer, and Pilate finally asked him this, Are you a king? Say with me, are, are you, you a king? king? See, the whole world is asking that question. The whole world. Pilate was a pagan and a heathen, and yet he wanted to know, are you a king? Jesus didn't answer any other question. It was the only question that was worthy for Jesus Christ to answer. And he, Jesus says that. Are you a king? And he had to answer because he is truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so we know that, that when Jesus faced the Sanhedrin there, when Caiaphas said, Are you the Son of God? I adjure you. Are you the Son of God? Jesus had to answer a question about his true identity. Yes, I am. And that's when Caiaphas tore his vest, and we know what happened after that. Jesus said, You're right. I am a king. You're, you're Jesus Christ. Your Savior, your Lord, is a king. And it's time the church start acting like we serve a king. It's time we start acting like we serve a king. In fact, Jesus says this. He said, my, my kingdom is so pure, there's no law against anything in my kingdom. Apostle Paul talks about that in, in, when he writes about the gifts of the Spirit. Or the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, humility, temperance. He says, against such there's no law. God said, my law is so high and so pure, there's nothing man or the devil or Satan or hell can say against my kingdom. It's so pure. What the apostle, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, it's not things, but it is love and joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Yes. Jesus said, my, my kingdom is so pure, man can't touch it, or man can't prosecute it, and Satan can't prosecute it. There's, how, can you, how can you argue against love, joy, peace, truth? How can you argue against that? I mean, somebody said they met Mother Teresa or something. You know, some people had issues with some of the things she did, but nobody had issues with her humanity, I can tell you that. Nobody had issues with her humanity. So, Jesus had to deal with all these issues. And I think that God uses times like this to expose religion or kingdom in the earth. And I believe one of the things God is exposing right now is religion in the earth. Because religion is the most dangerous opposition to the kingdom. Because religion is counterfeit to the kingdom of God. How many know that? Religion is counterfeit to the kingdom of God. It truly is. Religion allows you the illusion and assumption that you're okay. That's what religion does. That's why the number one opposition to Christ was not sinners. It was doctors of religion, lawyers of religion, Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, Herodians. People who studied the book but never knew the author of the book. That was the number one opposition to Jesus Christ. Even the Romans weren't opposed to Jesus. Sinners weren't opposed to Christ. But the religious, they were totally opposed to Jesus Christ. Because they had made in their mind their concept of what a kingdom was and what a king was, they missed the very king when he came. Do you know Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come and sup with him. We use that most of the time in the church as a voice or a word to non-believers. But if you go to Revelation chapter 3, do you know that's written to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3.20? Yes. It's written to Christians. Yes. And if you read on down there, you'll find out Jesus talks about, to John, he said they have a lukewarm spirit. He said they're not hot or cold. He said they have a lukewarm spirit and they have begun to trust everything. They begin to trust everything but me. And they have a religious spirit of trusting things. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, right? It's not things. Yeah. 
He said they put their trust in things. And Jesus said, they have put me outside through religion. They've put me outside the door, and I'm trying to knock to get back in. Revelation 3, 20 was written to Christians at the church of Laodicea. It wasn't written to pagans. Read it in the letter to the seven churches of Asia. It was written to Christians. Is Jesus knocking on your door today? There's a king knocking on your door. There's a king knocking on your door. And I pray, oh God, deliver me from religion. Nothing can hide God more successfully than religion. Because that in itself becomes God. That in itself, people will worship their religion rather than God. Do you know people that will fight over their religion? I know people that will literally fight over their religion. I've watched it, I've seen it. And I've had to referee it. Over people fighting over their religion and belief systems. In Matthew 15, 1 through 3, why did this, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, why do, you, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? I love Jesus' answer. Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? That was his answer, Matthew 15, 1 through 3. Let me tell you something you need to know. The devil can fight religion because it's of man. But he cannot fight the kingdom of God because it's of heaven. In religion, he's fighting man. In the kingdom, he's fighting Christ. See, Moses knew he operated in the presence of a king. Moses had experienced the very glory of God on the mountain. How, how, do you understand that? Moses had gone up, talked to God. God had given him the commandment. Moses knew, I serve a king. I serve royalty. And because I know that and I operate in his will and I operate in his presence, it will affect how I act, how I talk, how I speak, what I say to people. It will affect every action of my life because I know he's continually and honestly, purposely in my presence, second by second, minute by minute, day by day. You are in the presence of a king right now. Amen. Right now you're in the presence of a holy king. And one of the difference between Miriam and Moses was Moses understood kingship and royalty. Miriam operated in religion. I'll speak for God. I'll choose for God. God don't know what he's doing. I'll write a book and tell everybody this is what God really say and this is what God's really thinking. So I'll write a book. I got news for you. You don't need to write anything to add to this. You need to study this and see what it says. Yes. Moses knew he was operating in the presence of a king. Miriam forgot she was standing in the presence of the majesty of God Almighty. And I believe that God is moving his people into a realm of the presence and glory and demanding we recognize again once and for all and live in the presence of his majesty. What does the Apostle Paul say? He's come to this conclusion. He said, I've gone from the law to understanding the law persecuted and killed Jesus Christ through the Romans and through the Pharisees and Sadducees to understanding that this was the king. And now he says, in my king I live and I move and I breathe and I have my being in my king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Him we live and move and have our being. In Him who? Your King, Jesus Christ. You know what revival is at its core? At its core. Let me tell you what revival is. Recognizing God in His omnipresent majesty, royalty, and splendor. That's what revival truly is, and that's where it begins. Living in it, walking in it, talking in it, existing in it. When we step into the next level of spiritual understanding, that we're standing in the presence of His majesty. It will change how we act and speak and walk and talk. It will change how you worship when you know He's here. It will change your worship when you know the Lord of glory is here. Omnipresent God, He's here. So when you're worshiping, you have your hands lifted, you're worshiping God. You're standing around looking at what's outside, what's going by, what, voice, what noise is coming through the window. Jesus is here saying, are you going to miss me today? Israel missed their Messiah. And He was standing right in front of them. So I asked the Lord, Lord, how do we get to that next level? How do we get to the next step? There were two Christian musicians that left the church recently. Pretty famous. And they were fed up with the, what they thought was the inconsistencies of Christianity in relation to fairness and all that stuff. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what's their issue? And the Lord told me they've never understood my majesty. They've understood religion. They've understood church. And these boys were raised in the church. And they were in super church, children's church, young adult church, youth church, every church program there were. And they got into a point and they looked at religion and they looked at tradition. And what happened? They missed their king because they never had a relationship with his majesty. 
Jack Hayford in England. My goodness, these English people, Her Majesty, they're aware of her royalty and majesty 24 hours a day, even when they're not in her presence. They call her Her Majesty. Oh, what if the church started calling Jesus His Majesty? His Majesty. His Majesty. So let me tell you what can happen. So in 1976, Muhammad Ali, he came to the White Mountains of Arizona to train for a fight with Ken Norton. And I don't know about you, my family was all about sports, so boxing was a big deal. And he was training out at the Sholo Airport. He was staying in there at the Maxwell House of Sholo. He had 20 rooms there for all his... All his and the reason that he came to Sholo was he looked for a place that had elevation and a place nobody could find him. <laughs> so I don't know what happened, but a bunch of people found Sholo or, or something. And everybody in town knew it, and you could go out and watch him uh, spar and practice out there at the Shoal Airport. And I knew he was in town. So one night, I had a little gas station in Lakeside. Anybody know where the campground in Lakeside is? Uh, yeah. The Forest Service campground there, right across from there's a little store. It used to be called Strauss General Store. And for years, they had a, a, uh, it was a semi-automatic gun there, hanging up there. It was for sale. And of course, nobody could afford it. And I walked in one night, and nobody's there but a yellow station wagon. And I'm at the gas pumps, I, get, I go in, I see Tom's busy with a black guy, and I'm like, oh, God. So I go back and I get some milk and I get some cookies or whatever I got, and I come back and it dawns on me, hello, <laughs> guess who this is? Who do you think it was? Muhammad Ali. So I look at Tom and he's got a smile ear to ear. And I realize that's Muhammad Ali. So... I'm like, I want an autograph. Anybody ever get an autograph, want an autograph from somebody? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever? I, so I go outside and I'm waiting and I'm looking in the window and I see the transaction and I see the cash flowing and he bought that gun. And he's coming out. How many know that when you stand in the presence of somebody really famous or somebody really renowned, it, it, it affects how you act? And I was in such awe, I just stood there looking at him. Like a deer in the headlights. And I know he thought, who's this country bumpkin? And what is wrong with him? And he said, how you doing? And I froze. I froze. I was so in awe. What if we had that, that type of attitude toward Christ? That we would literally freeze in awe of our King. Finally, he walked on by me, got in the car, looked at me, shaking his head like, what is wrong with that joker? <laughs> Drove off in a yellow Ford station wagon. And I'm standing there and I'm like, you just missed an opportunity of a lifetime. <laughs> if you want to really change your life. Because I asked the Lord, Lord, how do some men uh, just arrive in the kingdom and become just amazing men and, God, men and women of God that you become in awe of? Now I asked you earlier, that, are you in awe of anybody spiritually? Some of you shook your heads. Do, do you have any spiritual heroes living on the earth? Billy Graham was one of my, I just, okay. Billy Graham was one of my spiritual heroes. I'm just going to be, I was in awe of his ministry. If you listen to the man preach, his preaching was, it was powerful and anointed. So he, he was one of the men that just, I was in awe of his ministry, his anointing, his gifting. So God puts that in the church. But God has put that in you and I also. And the Lord showed me something. You want to grow in the kingdom, stand in awe of your king. You want elevated in the kingdom, stand in awe of your king. Stand in his, awe of his presence, moment by moment, second by second. And I've often wondered at men that have just come to unbelievable spiritual heights in what they've done in the kingdom, and I realize they live above the minutia of life because they're so in awe of their king. Are you in awe of your king today? Are you so in awe of your king that you rise above the minutia and the vicissitude of life? That's the difference. That's what the Lord showed me. Don't stand there like me. I couldn't even talk. 
man, I know what he thought. These country people. <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> Missed an opportunity of a lifetime. There was nobody there but me and him. We could have had a conversation. <laughs> I wanted to ask him about the fight with Sonny Liston. <laughs> Stood there like that. Jesus Christ is standing right here. Are you in awe? You should be. You need to be. Because it will change everything about your life when you become in awe of the greatest person you ever have known or ever will know. Father, I just pray right now the Spirit of God will just minister the awe that we have in the splendor and glory of our King. That He is an awesome God. Ever living, immortal, invisible. Everything that exists came out of Him. It exists by Him. Everything's seen. So today, Father, I praise you and thank you that we serve the immortal, invisible King of glory, King of kings, and Lord of lords. And we give you praise, honor, and glory for that. Right now, if you would stand for the blessing. These are the words of your King. These are the words of your King over you. These are the words of your King, not mine. I'm just quoting the words of your King. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And your king says, if you'll put my holy name on your children, I will seek them. Says the Lord God of Israel, the king of the universe. If you receive it, say amen. amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.